Here's why I think we may be on the precipice of something revolutionary. The natural evolution of the development of the science is that you have your theories, and theories work their way into people with more practical minds to create the applied science. That's correct. Usually a lag time there, lag time between, certainly between Einstein's, Einstein's theory of relativity of 1905 and working its way into the creation of nuclear energy, for instance, yep. by way of example. I think what you have right now is a rather unusual situation where you have the development of the applied science before the genesis of the theoretical structure. Exactly. Exactly. Or at least in light of all these other theories that you've that you've been, been enlightening about, um, let me just say that it's possible that you have the introduction of the applied science before you have the suturing of all of these fragmentary theories which would help to create a kind of cohesive theoretical structure to provide it with, uh, well, greater theoretical le le legitimacy, if you will. Exactly, and the, what you run into is, uh, now speak of human beings. Scientists are, after all, human beings. They have all the same reactions of normal human beings. There's nothing uh, highly superior about being a scientist. Uh, that means they form a bell-shaped curve just like any other group of people. Now, yeah, there's a, they like to the joke that 50% uh, of all physicists graduated in the bottom half of their class. That's correct. Then, let's talk about what caliber of people they are. I know from the bell-shaped curve that they fit. There's a certain percentage of them up on the higher end of the curve that are almost angelic, highly moral, highly dedicated to the scientific method. Uh, you know, we'll always try to, to, to take a model, for example, into account. Is that modelable by my model or not? Now, the broad band is not going to question the models or talk about models. They're just going to be applying and doing their job and using physics as it has been developed to the best of their ability. They're going to be good physicists, good scientists, doing good work, but they're not going to be creating you a new model, and they're not going to be questioning the model you're working in. Now, the lower end of those people are just about like devils. They have absolutely no morals. They have no dedication to scientific method. They wouldn't even recognize the spelling of it. They're manipulative. They'll do anything they have to do to human systems or otherwise to climb the ladder and get as high up as they can in control, and they're driven by greed, power, prestige, money, all the other good stuff. Who's going to be the big monkey? Is their driving motif from the moment they get up in the morning till the time they go to bed at night, and then when they dream at night, they're still in the same motif. Okay, the problem with those is they skew the curve. Because of their manipulations and scheming and conniving and all this, they do tend to scamper up and bias the bell-shaped curve. Now, they don't bias it completely, thank God, because we've still got a lot of good scientists, and we've still got a scientific method, and we've still got a scientific community. But they do everything they can to turn it into a dogma and a religion. Now, when the money has to start passing through their hands, and there's more of these up at these higher levels where we get our hands on the money, that's where the power is in any human system. You know, control the money, you control the system. The more they get up higher in, that, in positions in that, then they're able to influence and control a much vaster part of science than we would be comfortable with. They're turning it into dogma, and that has progressed far too far along the line. So they have a disproportionate voice. That's correct. They have a disproportionate voice. The other thing is they attack anything that's out of the box that they're comfortable in, and they know. They attack it with a viciousness seldom seen in science. The recent uh, viciousness of the attacks on cold fusion is one example. Uh, the attacks on anybody like uh, me, for example, and I, I consider myself a poor example. I'm not a super scientist. I'm just a guy that looks at models and looks at what they contain and what they don't contain. That's basically what I do. Uh, but they attack anybody who's working out of the box as if he were an utter raving lunatic and as if the science were perfect and it were a religion brought down on a stone tablet with Moses or something. That's the problem. You're up against dogma, not scientific method. Scientific method is very clear. If the experiment is done and done well and properly, and if it is repeatable and it repeats the results, and those results fall outside the present model, the scientific method says you must change the model. That's not Tom Bearden, that's scientific method. 
Now, when you say, we're going to attack you fiercely and we're going to say, you know, the experiment is wrong, I don't care how many people replicated it, I don't care what you did, you're wrong, the experiment is wrong, and you're a lunatic for even bringing it to my attention, get out of my face, that is not science, that's dogma. And you're dealing with people who want to manipulate it right where it is and very happy in their cushy position. You're threatening to them. You're going to change the situation, the status quo. You don't like that at all. That's your problem. Interesting. You're going to change the situation, the status quo. You don't like that at all. That's your problem. Interesting. And, of course, you know, you can put all kind of quotations from eminent scientists on that. You know, Feynman, for example, says, you know, most of the things that we list as givens in science, we don't even know what they are. We don't know what energy is. There's not an adequate definition of force. And he said, try it. If you think there is, try to find one. You won't find it. If you really look at the problem, I couldn't find a single physicist or a single physics dictionary, and I bought the best that was available that adequately defined the potential. And the reason was quite simple. They don't calculate the potential. There is not a university in the United States that has ever calculated the magnitude of a potential. There's not an electrical engineer or a grad student. What they calculate is what is diverged from the potential by a unit point charge that you just arbitrarily stick there in space. Now before the charge is there and before the interaction, what exists there? It's not the E field and it's not the potential that you have in your textbook. At best, that's a, a real careful scientist will say potential intensity. That's a indication of the intensity of the potential, not what the magnitude. The magnitude the thing reaches through all space, so what's its magnitude? Same thing with the field. The imprecision that has been fostered in like all electrical engineers talk about drawing power. You can't draw power from the wall. Power is the rate, time rate of doing work, and the work is the time rate of changing the energy, or you know, like scattering it or dissipating it in a resistor, and that's in the local component. It has nothing to do with what comes out of the wall. The other thing, energy flow, has nothing to do with the electrons coming out of the wall and flowing this current. That's the energy dissipation going on in the circuit. It has to do with that. The energy flow is outside the wire. Even the standard pointing theory goes into that, and if it reaches on into space, out way past the wire. Pointing never considered anything except the amount that hits the surface charge and gets caught and drawn back into the charge. It actually hits the field from the surface charge and gets drawn back in to the wire, back and forth. That little bit gets added to the wire. It's a tiny bit of the energy that's out there. Heaviside, the independent co-discoverer of so-called energy flow through space, which has got to be changed, by the way. It, it disagrees with quantum mechanics. The energy flow in the observation itself, the energy flow uh, does not actually conclude just the amount that's caught, just the diverged pointing component. It also includes a component that does not get caught and does not get diverged and misses the circuit. It's enormously greater than the other one. But now back in the 1880s you had a problem. If you came up and you said that the terminals of every generator and every battery out there, that from the terminals there comes this outpouring of energy far greater than the amount of mechanical shaft energy input to the generator or the amount of chemical energy dissipated in the battery, you would have been violently attacked by the small scientific community that there was, there was only about, uh, about three dozen electrodynamicists in the whole world. You would have been violently attacked as being a perpetual motion nut. So they had to be very careful with it. Now, Lorentz understood both the difference between both sets of theory. Heaviside was better. Pointing got the direction wrong. Heaviside corrected him. But Pointing published prestigiously. Heaviside was, was, was self-taught. Brilliant man, but self-taught. Never went to university. He published more obscurely. He later got a prestigious publication in uh, the Royal Society Proceedings, as were uh, Pointing published. But... Uh, he spoke of it in terms of angles. He's very cautious not to say there's a hell of a lot more energy pouring out of those terminals than we're putting in that thing, so what's happening? Lorentz took a look at it and said, my God, you know, how do I explain that? Even the great Lorentz could not dare to say, you know, there's 10 to some number. You grab a number, 12. I did an estimate one on one circuit. It was 10 to the 13th. But uh, say 10 to the 12th times.